Does anyone, has anyone heard me talk before? Um, I'm back in the light. <laughs> I can't see you, but I can't see you when I'm in the light. Um, I want to see each and every one of you. Um, so does anyone, I would love to not talk about who I am and what I do. Does anyone, do we need any of that? Does anyone know who I am? Yes. All right, so I'd like to, okay. I'll talk to you afterwards too. Trained as an architect, now I'm a developer. Developers are the scourge of the earth for good reason. Somewhere between krill and lawyers on the food chain. <laughs> That's what I do now. And I only do it because I'm an architect by training and I want to build really cool shit. And the only way to do it is kind of to own, um, own the purse strings, own the program, own what I call phase zero. Architects get hired after the developers already decided what this is gonna be. Oh, it's gonna be a piece of shit, extruded lot line, vinyl window, vinyl siding building on division. <laughs> or on Alberta, or on wherever. So, so the only reason I do what I do is so I don't have to wait for someone enlightened to walk in the door to, to hire me. I'm not hoping, I'm not sitting passively waiting for that to happen. And as everyone here is, I assume, creative or interested in, in the creative endeavors, I hope you find a way to just kind of own more of that phase zero. But that's not what this is about. Um, this also isn't about a retrospective or anything that I've already done. Um, um, it's about some big ideas and oddly enough, the, the money behind the big ideas and the finances and the investment, which doesn't sound creative at all, but if that's the horsepower, if that's the gasoline that I need to make the ideas happen, I don't wanna just talk to you about ideas that will probably never happen. I have, I have drawers and drawers and drawers um, of napkins with sketches of buildings that I'll never build. I don't wanna to talk to you about more ideas that I won't build. These three ideas I'm gonna talk about today, I either, I'm breaking ground on one next month, um, I own the land on the other one, and I got to find them on the third one, that'll be a 2017 project, but they're all gonna happen. Um, but what's fascinating about them is how they happen, I think. Um, so, that's me. Um, so today is a talk about risk. Um, I was putting the slides together for this a couple days ago, um, and, and I was talking to my wife, and uh, she was actually more nervous than I am about this. Um, <laughs> I'll explain why in a second. <laughs> so that's where we used to live, Beth and me and our three kids. It's on Northeast 45th Avenue. And um, wonderful house, wonderful street. Um, bought it cheap uh, back in the day. Used to work for Dale when I lived here and at Fletcher for Iat. And then that happened. Um, and then I, I came home one random Tuesday and I talked to my family and I said, hey, um, we have to sell our house. Uh, I, have, I have bills to pay, and I have this crazy thing where I pay all my bills, and it sucks. So it sucks for you guys. I'm sorry. Um, and you know how, you know how um, Edith lives on the left, and she's, you know, and then Jules and Kathy live on the right. And we, so those are, uh, we're going to have to say goodbye to our neighbors. Um, uh, this is our new neighbor. <laughs> because, because we're going to move into uh, uh, a building I just bought on Sandy Boulevard. Um, this literally is uh, where I took my family and we brought duct tape and, we, and there were, and my kids were like, well, where's my bedroom? I'm like, I think your bedroom. <laughs> literally, I mean, literally, uh, we, I think we have photos of the tape on the floor and why, I don't know why Gracie got the one skylight and the, Jack, and Jack and LJ didn't get any closets or windows. <laughs> um, true story, I'll show, I'll show you what it looked like at the end. Um, so uh, I think, um, well, as I was talking to Beth about that two, two days ago, I'm like, yeah, putting this together, what's the topic? Risk. She's like, well, fuck, I should be giving this lecture. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm married to you. <laughs> um, totally true. Um, uh, so three ideas, um, and the three roles I'm playing, while talking about the ideas, first project, I don't like reading slides, so I can figure you guys can read. <laughs> Second project. And the third project. 
So, um, so does everyone know the fair hair dumbbell? Is everyone tired of hearing about the fair? It's like the <laughs> fatigue of build it already. Um, so, this is. Um, uh, sorry, Beth. I keep talking about you. Uh, but it's like, please don't ask the room for money. <laughs> Um, I'm totally asking you for money right now, but I'm not, but I'm not. But if the big idea is about, wouldn't that be fucking amazing, dot, dot, dot. Um, um, so, taking a step back, pre-recession, when I lived on 45th Street, I didn't have investors. I just was smoke and mirrors and really aggressive bank loans and, um, and doing kind of small, nimble things and waiting for the market to, to catch up. Um, I built this little mini empire up of, the Box and One, Ode to Roses, the Burnside Rocket, neat buildings that I'm really proud of. I don't own any of them now because in the recession, the banks came to me and said, hey, you know, on the rocket, for example, if you could just bring in a half a million dollars on Tuesday, um, we're good. We're good. <laughs> and I got, you know, I don't have a half million dollars. Um, so, so I had to sell a building, I had to sell everything because I didn't have enough horsepower to, to resettle. Post-recession, every building I've done since the recession, every project starting with the ocean, I've had the, the, the shittiest part of my day or my week or my month or my job is to ask rich people for money. Hey, you know, and, and the reality is they, they, they need, there's more, there's more of them than there are of me. So they need places to put their money. And I get that. It's still, still a weird feeling to be like, hey, can I, do you have a million dollars? Do you want to do a project? Um, I'm getting better at that. I'm finding out what I, who the, what I call the enlightened money is, where that is. Um, usually I'll meet with someone for a coffee. It's like a date. You go out with coffee with someone and you know within five minutes that this is, there's never gonna be a second date. So you know, I go to, go to a cup of coffee, get a cup of coffee, and you're like, cool, I've got a million dollars. Um, and all you talk about is, is yield and return. And, and by the end of the, of the date, I'm like, you should go see someone else. You should go date someone else. I say, you should go buy a self-storage facility out by the airport. <laughs> Literally, just side note, like little tea, those are the most profitable buildings in America right now. If that's your goal, go buy one and that's awesome. If you're wanting to, that's not, this is not <laughs> that. If you look at this and you're like, well, oh, that sounds great. By the way, the finances that underpin this are really strong. That's, that's exciting too. I want to talk about that too. But the end result is to make Portland a better city, make, or a more interesting city. I want, I'm glad that Celia almost got in the crash in front of the zipper. That's my goal. I want little <laughs> fender benders. It is. I want little fender benders on every intersection in town because people are looking at the buildings, not the car in front of them. I want to live in that city. And Amsterdam's like that. Paris is like that. Um, Portland's great because of the spaces between the buildings, not the buildings themselves. It's changing. There's one north up on Fremont and Williams. There's the B-side six. There's some fun buildings. Um, do you guys know about the crowdfunding for this building? How many people have seen the video? Oh, we should get more people seeing the video. It's kind of a cool video. Um, so I've already raised my enlightened deck. I've raised two and a half million dollars from rich people to build this building. I have the construction loan. Anderson Construction is building it, and we're breaking ground next month. That's exciting. I actually don't need your money. <laughs> but I'm one of a handful of buildings in, in the nation that has been SEC approved. I spent two years working with the Securities and Exchange Commission to get this building approved to crowdfund. So while I don't need your money, I so want the story to be that Portland, Oregon built this because of everyday people like you, not because I met someone who happens to have a million dollars or five million dollars. That's the way it used to be. These deals, these buildings are built because I'm having a conversation with someone on the 17th fairway of a country club golf course. That's fine, but I want to open that up. I want the model to shift. And the reason I want everyone here, I, I want and don't want you all to pitch it. If everyone here gave the minimum, which is $3,000, and owned a slice of this building and got an 8% per year return, which kicks any CD you can get's ass, um, there's a million dollars here. And that's a good story. The New York Times, when I said, hey, will you write a story about this? This is a big deal. I got my SEC approval. They said, um, well, we'll write the story after you earn your money. I'm like, no, I need, it. I, need, I need the world to know about this now. Um, they're going to write a story no matter what. I don't want them to write a story about how um, this outfit in Portland tried to crowdfund this building and failed. Because if we can't do it, no one's going to do it. And I, don't, I want everyone to have the opportunity 
to own this. I want, I want the gap between the rich and the poor in America um, uh, to, to be closed. And you're not invited into the room. Is anyone here an accredited investor? It's a horrible question to ask, because no one, even if you are, not going to raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> We're one rich gal over here. We're all flocking afterwards. Um, I don't even know what that means, but I can, accredited investors are who I talk to on all my buildings um, now. And, and I won't do this every time, it's too exhausting, but it's, it's really powerful. It dilutes the voice of the bank, it dilutes the voice of the high net worth investor, it dilutes, I don't want anyone to tell me, do you guys care whether I paint the building this, or I mean, if I paint it this, is that a problem for you? No, that's cool. All right. At $3,000, I don't care if you care or not. <laughs> I know, I, know that you, I know that you're up for it, but you know, if you give me a million dollars, I gotta kinda listen to you and it sucks. So anyway, that's why, that's why I want everyone here, literally, or your mom or whoever, after you leave here, if you go onto the website and click, 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 it's like three or four, it's like amazon.com, go hit the cart and then spend 3,000 bucks. Um, I actually went to Fundrise, the biggest crowdfunding outfit in, at a, in DC, and they posted this, they reached out and found me and posted this on their website. And if you read that, it's 10, over 10 million, now it's over $11 million in interest. 1,500 people uh, have said, that's badass. If that, went, if that went live, I would give you money. Um, I reached out to Fundrise. This, this is two weeks old, by the way. So this is just, we're averaging $10,000 a day from total strangers. Um, and we're two weeks old, this is exciting. It's not fast enough, it's not game changing. I don't think that's why I want everyone to raise the ante. Fundrise said, yeah, we now got some money from Wall Street. We're now just doing accredited investors. We've shifted our model. Like, whoa, whoa, wait, two years ago you told me like, let's do this and I'm ready, here we go. And they're like, yeah, we're sorry. So, um, so I can't get access, I don't know who these 1,550 people are. That's the number now that want to put over $11 million in my building. I don't, I'm locked out of them. So I'm just doing it myself. Um, and I, I think it's fascinating. I'm excited as hell about it. I actually think today is a really telling day. If a week from now I get a tiny bump, then I'll know this might be something I pull the plug on and I just build the building the traditional way. And that'll be sad, but it's a part of risk and this element failed and I won't do it again. Um, but I'll still build a building. It'll still be good for Portland and all that neat stuff. Um, that's me being the Amway salesman. Put that away. Now I'm going to preach a little bit. Affordable housing. There's a huge problem in the city with, with, with homelessness um, and then in general affordable housing. Um, we just passed this, a bill as a state or changed our, the legal uh, arrangement as a state to allow inclusionary zoning, which is awesome. If anyone here helped work on that, you should be applauded. Um, there's so much bad stuff getting built, so many bad, greedy, I call them greedy buildings, apartments being built right now. Um, it's not good for the city. So I, by the virtue of the name Guerrilla Development, I, I don't wait around for like the public sector to figure something out or I, I, uh, I, I don't have the patience for that. So I, I bought this building, I bought this land, I'm an escrow on it, um, the Atomic Auto site on Sandy and I'm all Sandy Boulevard all the time for whatever reason. Um, hookers and cocaine. Um, so, so that's gonna be an 88 unit apartment building. And every unit's the same. And there's a reason for that. It's kind of an egalitarian thing. Um, every unit's a 600 square foot, double height, spiral staircase, bed mezzanine, um, three story walk up. I'm trying to put no elevator in it. Um, because since every unit is internal circulation, it's not really an ADA. I have plenty of ADA compliant buildings. Not every experiment has to check every box. This is more about, about how do I get rent on 14 lofts. 20% uh, of the lofts, of the 88 lofts, will be at 80% of median family income. There's a, there's a program at the city that allows that to happen and I get deferred taxes for that. And that just makes sense. It's, it's net neutral cost wise. It's stupid for any developer not to do that, yet no one's doing it. That's not the experiment. The experiment is, um, <laughs> you're totally curious to hear what I'm gonna say right now, aren't you? Yes. Uh, <laughs> that was just a mistake. Uh, no, um, so the ex experiment is the high net worth individuals, 
that I talked about. The enlightened capital, going to coffee with you. Sorry, I keep pointing to you. Um, going to coffee with you and having you say, and I, I'm saying to you, I want to do an affordable housing project on Sandy Boulevard. And I want to do it, and I want to internally subsidize it. We're not going to ask for a penny of subsidy. You and I are going to figure this out. Um, you're a unicorn. You're like, you're, you, I mean, you're special as all hell. I want you to get less money for your return, and we'll take that money and we'll put it back into the project. So I, f I had two chats with my two favorite investors. No, no favorites, like saying my favorite kids. Um, I, I do rank my kids, by the way. <laughs> it changes every week. Um, but I've only, I asked three guys. Two of them said, sure, I'm, I'm in. And they put some money in. Not all of it, but enough. And I know, I, I know they do exist, and they'll put more in. But the idea is, mathematically, um, I give an 8% return to all my investors. If you give me a million dollars, every year I'd give you $80,000 back. And that's just the dividend. There's also the appreciation, and the loan gets smaller. And that's an interesting financial model. But on the investor side, um, you're already rich. You don't, you don't put money in for the dividend. You put money in for the long game. And we're going to own this for a long time. So what I, say, what I said to Chris and Alex, um, no last names, um, is let's, let's make, and by the way, I have a million dollars of sweat equity. So I need $4 million from you and a million dollars from me. That's $5 million. Let's all just agree that 4% is enough. I mean, how much is enough? When you count the appreciation and all the other things that, the, the, um, that quietly accrue and make us money, plus 8%, it's about 20% per year. That's silly money. That, let's, how about 16% per year? Let's just take the, take the little slice off the top and put it back in the building. So when you take 4%, the delta between 8% and 4% is 4, of, you know, <laughs> I'm an I got my degree in architecture. Um, <laughs> that, that's uh, $200,000 a year that you and I are saying, I don't need that. Let's make this building better. Um, and when you take that, you divide it by 12 months, it's $18,000 a year. I can, the, the typical market rent, 60% of these units are gonna be, I want as much as possible. Because it's, it's a good design. I'm, design should get good money, I'm proud of that. I want other developers who do shitty design to be like, ooh, Kavanaugh's getting, a lot more rent than I am. Maybe I should not build such shit. Um, <laughs> I want that to be part of the equation too. But, um, but then I want 20% to be at around 1,000 bucks a month. The market rate's 1650 a month, crazy. 20% 20, 20 of them will be at 1,000 bucks a month. And then you take the $18,000 a month that we're gonna internally subsidize. I'll have 14 units in this building that will run for $582 a month. Thanks. I'm excited about that. And you and I could agree on 5% or 3% or whatever it is. Or you and I can agree on, let's not do 14 units. Let's do, let's give away five units. And, and, and the neat thing is, this is the second part of the experiment. I want to discriminate. I know I'm on record and I'm being videotaped right now. And <laughs> my lawyer's probably not happy with this statement. But you can legally discriminate. So once we have 14 units, um, what I want to do is, I've been trying to figure out the homeless problem in Portland for, for a couple years and I can't. My brain's not big enough. It's, it's, it's too much for me. But I can help. Do we have any social workers in the room? You can raise your hand. It's better than raising your hand if you're an accredited investor. <laughs> um, so I want to hold the first pass at these 14 units. I'll sign a three year lease with you if you're working at Sisters of the Road Cafe or if you're working at Transition Project Housing Northwest. If you're in the front lines every day, making Portland a better city because you're working on the homelessness problem, you get first dibs. Because you're allowed to discriminate by profession, which is really cool. Um, <laughs> and if I only find eight, then, then what do you want to do? Uh, school teachers? Public school teachers? Uh, I mean, I, it's so fucking fun to think about this <laughs> But there's no money, there's no, there's no public funds that are tethered or tied to it. I don't have to follow any rules. As long as I don't break the law, I can get crazy with it. And I want to do a model, and I want to shame the hell out of other developers. I want their kids to come home and say, you know, Daddy, I heard about this guy. And he's doing, Why aren't you doing that? <laughs> All right, that's my second idea. My third idea, um, taking that same model, um, I have a problem with gentrification, and I have a problem with it because I'm a gentrifier. And I didn't think I was, but my, my 
oldest is a senior in high school, and he did a story on gentrification, and we were at the dinner table a couple months ago, and he's like, God, you know, Dad, I, I think you're a gentrifier. I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> um, and I, I'm not because in, in my head, I, you know, well, and of course, by the end of dinner, I'm like, fuck, I am. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry I said it. fuck as well. Please pass the butter. Um, so, like, this, these are some of the first products I did when I moved to town 25 years ago. This is the Sun and Moon House. I bought them at 61 and 63 Northeast Thompson between Rodney and Williams in the Elliott neighborhood. And uh, both houses looked like the one on the left. And they were both uh, just beat to hell. Um, and I bought them both for $65,000 total and fixed them up. I was working for Dale at the time, and I fixed them up in nights and evenings, and it was fun. Um, and I didn't displace anybody. I didn't hurt anybody. When the dumpster showed up, the, the block had, gave like a hallelujah chorus. I'm like, please, thank you so much, because that's been a, a problem on the block, and it's been um, a concern for us. So now we're happy that it's going to become, I, I sold them, the owner occupied, people mowing their lawn right now. It's, it's, it's improvement. But because of that, the price went up for other folk. And because of, over time, the Elliott neighborhood, where I've purchased and fixed up a dozen houses in my, in my day, is now a pretty expensive place to live. And what that looked like when I first started, 20 years ago, it does not look like that now. And, and it doesn't mean that in any house that I worked on, I was the problem, but overall, I was part of a trend that pushed people out. Um, so, taking the financial model of uh, what I just talked about with the new new crusher, with the atomic auto building. Um, I want to take that same model. I'm not going to point to you anymore. So you're going to give me some a million dollars. <laughs> but we'll agree to that same 4% instead of the power of 4%. But instead of, I'm going to charge a ton of money for the residential. But I see a concern down, down the road where uh, affordable commercial is going to be a problem. We love Port Portlandia as a show. Quirky little shops. Those quirky shops aren't going to be here in, in 10 years. Or they're going to be out on the, on the fringes of town because they can't afford, afford to pay $2.50 per month per square foot. So let's do this project and, I'll, and we'll take the power of 4% and we will hold commercial spaces for not $2.50 a square foot, but for say 75 cents a square foot. Silly, silly low rent. Um, the Elliott neighborhood had a burgeoning African American business community back in the day. It doesn't now. Uh, I cannot discriminate. So this is where, I, this is where I gets, it gets tricky. This is where it gets dicey. This is where I start looking like that. Um, <laughs> but, but, sorry. Um, but I can't say, hey, if you're African American, I'll give you, I'll give you cheap rent. That is illegal. But I can say to you, I think, I think, if there are any lawyers in the house, I'd love to chat with you after this, about this. I think I can say, if you can prove that you have ties to the Elliott neighborhood three generations ago. So that's what, that's what I'm gonna do. It'll be next year. I don't have the land yet. I'll figure it out. Um, but, but most importantly, I have, the, I have the gasoline for the engine. And I have the idea. So those are the hardest parts. Um, those are the three ideas. Uh, it, they, they sound like this. I, I know I, on, on some level, uh, look like this guy right now. With, you know, is, that, is that real? Is that crazy? Who, who the hell is this? I promise you, behind every one of the ideas, there is a shitload of boring Excel spreadsheets that I run through. By the time, like, like I mentioned in the article in the Mercury, this isn't risky for me. What I do isn't risky. Um, because by the time I break ground, it's done. It's, it's, it's so scientifically detailed and broken down that uh, the risk comes up to the point that I do break ground. And at that juncture, it's just connecting the dots and getting it done. Um, so has anyone seen what this looks like now? Um, <laughs> so it looks like that. And um, so that's, that's LJ and Jack's in the back. And, um, that was, the, that was the front yard. Hey, you guys, this is going to be our front yard. <laughs> <laughs> and it looks like that, which is kind of great. Um, but again, the real risk is in Beth and the kids, like getting in the car, handing the keys to our house to a, an estate salesman and saying, you can sell everything because we're just going to start new. Um, and, and rolling into that. Um, any questions? <laughs> Thanks.
I'll repeat the questions for you guys. With your focus on Sandy Boulevard and your, your knowledge there, have you spent much time with the folks at Hatch and, in, and investigating um, community capital for, for fundraising? Uh, question is, is, because I'm on Sandy Boulevard and Hatch is there, do you guys know what Hatch is? Um, yeah. a great, great outfit, just two doors down from, like right in the middle of where all my stuff is on Hatch. Have I investigated working with them on community capital and, and, and crowdfunding? I haven't. I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm a bit of a lone wolf. I'm not a good partner. I, I just want to go and build more buildings. I have, I, I refer to all those napkin sketches of buildings. Um, <laughs> there are more buildings than I have time. So if, if someone came to me and said, this is a way to get more buildings built from Hatch, if you want to talk afterwards about, hey, hey Kevin, there's some low-hanging fruit you're not picking, that's great because I hate trying to figure out the money part of it. I just want to build more buildings. So if that's what you're talking about, I'd love to chat with you, but I don't like proactively going out and creating partnerships with entities. Um, um, I just want to go build buildings. But I'm probably misunderstanding your question. Yeah, uh, Hatch is not so much them as, as the source of the money. It's more of Hatch is involved with uh, getting a law passed in Oregon that allows community Oregonians to invest. Correct. So there's a law. Hatch is working on a law that allows uh, communities and, and or organizations to invest um, akin to the crowdfunding world. And I will, I will applaud that from the high heavens, but I don't have the idea of sitting at a table with 17 people and lawmakers down in Salem to push something through. I will sign something, but I'm not, I'm the last guy that you want. I'll be Don Quixote individually tilting into windmills, but I don't want to join a band of Don Quixotes. Um, that just isn't interesting to me, but I will, I will support you. Kucha. Yeah. And one of the presentations was the artist that's going to paint the dumbbell building. And I didn't realize. Oh, Dan Cohen? I didn't realize that it was going to be hand painted yeah. until last night. And I went, holy shit, that's just another layer of great ideas. Yeah. Which is great because, so that wasn't a, so you're in trouble because that wasn't an official day question. Um, <laughs> the comment from the second row was that, 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 that the Pachaka Cha at Hatch last night, Dan Cohen, who's going to paint the dumbbell, it's going to be hand painted with German mineral paints, Keim crazy expensive, it's gonna take eight weeks to do it. Actually, the city isn't letting me paint it that floral. I, I purchased that, that Florentine pattern from the Rossi paper company in Italy, and then the city said, yeah, it's, it's copyrighted, you can't, you can't, but I bought it. Yeah, but even, you can't own the copyright, it doesn't matter, it's against the billboard laws. So we actually have four artists, I can't tell you who they are, they're coming to town May 23rd, uh, a Portlander, uh, Oakland, LA, and Argentina, from 60, they're the finalists, to come up with that original design that Dan Cohen is then going to spend, take his crew of eight and spend eight weeks painting the building, including the roof of the building. It's going to be cool. Wow. <laughs> Thanks. How long did it take when you drove your family into the Zipper building? How long did it take before it looked like you, you showed us? How long did it take to go from before, before like the Merle Norman before and after makeup yeah. job on the, on the ocean? Um, my products typically take, um, six to 12 months, that, that was my first post-recession job. I was doing it, um, I didn't have a ton of uh, enlightened capital, so it took a little longer, probably eight months. But that's what I want to, well, that's kind of what I want to do. The question was, when I do mixed use buildings, most of what I do is mixed use. Um, can I flip the equation of affordability for the commercial instead of for the housing? So that's what I want to do. In, is that? Well, no, both. I mean. Yeah, or anything. Well, the only thing is the power of 4%. I can do, I, we can do anything. So if you give me a million dollars, no pressure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we could do friggin' anything as long as we're not breaking laws. And there's a lot of leeway once you're not getting into bed with the public sector on what's legal. Um, it's just that that's not normally how it's done. So people think, well, if you do affordable housing, the housing then, then there's all these things that are attached to it that are um, awkward. And let's just avoid that. And let's agree to not be greedy. Hey, Mary. Mary, uh, can I tell you guys? Mary was one of the first people to uh, invest, is not part of the crowdfunding, but one of the long term investors in the Fairhead Dumbbell. As a friend, not as an accredited. <laughs> Correct. You're allowed a certain number of unaccredited investors in the long-term capital stack, and Mary's one of those. My question, though, is back to Sandy Boulevard, and it's not just for you, but for everyone in the audience. 
who has perhaps been to a great city um, anywhere in the world, what is your image of a boulevard? <laughs> what is the image of a boulevard? What is the image, look at Sandy Boulevard, of a boulevard? One story buildings improve Sandy becoming a boulevard. Um, are you aware that the new comp plan does in fact um, have far more density on Sandy? So I'm just wondering why um, redevelop in one story building? Oh, so Mary's great because Mary's a gadfly and she likes pushing boundaries, which is <laughs> I think fantastic. And, and, um, and when I, when I talked about, if you give me $3,000, you can't tell me uh, how, what, what I can paint my building, but if you give me a million, I, you still can't, but I have to listen to you. The neat thing with Barry is, she doesn't even have to give you any money. She'll come in the room and she will demand, <laughs> no, Portland needs more Marys, flat out fact. So um, you didn't say the zipper by name, but I know that you didn't like the zipper and the fact that I bought this building, land, and I built a one-story building. When a dense Portland, I actually love this question, we all want a dense Portland. I want Portland to be more like Paris and Amsterdam. By the way, Paris and Amsterdam are five-story buildings, five-story cities. They're not 25-story cities. They're very dense, but they don't, they're dense by the bodies in them, not by an FAR ratio, floor area ratio. Um, architects and developers always think of FAR, and I want to switch that. And Zipper, one of my experiments, two of my experiments with Zipper, one was lenticular art. Can I make art at 35 miles an hour? Um, scared the shit out of me until we hung those pieces up. I didn't know if it was going to work or not. I think it works. I'm not sure, but I think it mostly works. The second part of the experiment is questioning d density. So to answer your question, I don't think density is about stories. I don't think density is about FAR. I think density, density is about number of bodies that show up every day on that site. And last night I was meeting with four people about going to another project and we were sitting up by the fire pit looking at plans. And the zipper was packed. And it was a Thursday night, and, and roughly 600 people a day go to the ocean. And the ocean is not dense. It's a 0.5 FAR. It's not what we envision as planners or as visionaries in our city becoming. I don't care because it's activated as hell. The zipper is really vibrant and compelling. It backs up the Sandy Boulevard and the Pepsi plant and barbed wire. And there, are, there were at least 600 people yesterday who showed up at the zipper to be part of something that uh, it doesn't matter if they then got in an elevator and went upstairs into their apartments. That's going to happen. The Atomic Auto Project is across the street. I'll put 88 units over there, but not every block has to be the same thing. That's another thing that I have a problem with in formulaic development. Not every block, not every building has to have the same program. When we go to Amsterdam, when we go to Paris, there's a diversity. There's a lot of one-story buildings in Amsterdam and Paris but they're right next to five-story buildings and then a three-story building next to that. Why can't we do that? I'm actually hoping that the economy slows down a little bit and the silliness stops. So we, have to, we can be a little more thoughtful about just the shit we're throwing up. Because hey, I just did this building here, it was really successful. I'll just take that plan and I'll put it here. It's feeling more like Shanghai than like Portland. Gentrification guilt? Yes. Do I have any advice for gentrification guilt? That's a great question. Um, well, just, you have a little? That's, yeah. that's awesome. Guilt, I, I think, when we were dating, uh, my wife told me that guilt was like a useless emotion. And I actually, and at the time, I, and I agree with that statement, I actually want more guilt. I want more, are you a developer? No, I'm just a homeowner. Okay, you're a homeowner, okay. So I want developers to understand guilt, and I want other people to like, think about what the right answer is. But yeah, I, I can see as a homeowner, you, if you just paid 700,000 for a house that, <laughs> you're laughing, you probably paid exactly 700,000 <laughs> for a house that two years ago was 300, and um, so I'm a, I'm a capitalist and a socialist. So I'm a developer, so I'm a capitalist. I actually love the numbers, I love the math. Um, um, I love tilting at windmills, but I'm a socialist. I want to change the way it's done. I want to, to, to shrink that gap um, in, the, in the wealth spectrum in America. Um, I like that you have guilt. I don't think there's anything you or I can do to make that house worth anything less than $700,000. I mean, you could, you could go out to 144th and Southeast Flavel and buy a house and do the ocean project and like pioneer a neighborhood, um, but that might not be what is interesting to you. 
horrible, horrible answer. It's a tricky question. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, and I don't know. Did, so, trying to figure out the the four percent and like that shouldn't just be for the rich accredited folk. How can that be a larger discussion? Because you probably would be game in investing in a product and getting four percent. Um, and if it was if it was in your neighborhood, if it was making an impact, is that what you're kind of saying? How do we tease that out? And, Yeah. I'm just wondering where, you know, what the, the so why four? Yeah. Like so why 4%? So the, this is the first one out of the gate. So I always make mistakes. So the, the, the mistake on this one might be that 4% I left money on the table and I could have had a deeper impact because the investors would have been fine at two or three. Um, maybe I don't get the money quickly and it becomes a really tough slog and I needed to offer 6% and it would happen quicker and I can do more projects. I mean, it, this first one's really gonna let me know a lot about what the second one or the third one might look like. I always post all my pro forma and plans and photos of my products online, not just as PDFs, but you can literally download my, my pro forma in Excel and fuck around with them and, I mean, be a developer. You, you don't need a, a license or a degree. You just need a pretty big risk appetite. Uh, do I wake up in the morning nervous that, it, that something's not going to work? Um, uh, never. Um, and I, th I think that's abnormal, uh, honestly. I, I remember I, I used to, for the most part, lecture to architecture students saying, hey, speaking of Don Quixote, or, or the evangelical Don Quixote, hey, follow me, let's, you know, let's go be developers, let's change the world. And after one lecture, uh, my friend Francis Dardis, um, pulled me aside and said, hey, you can't, you can't do that. Because you, you can't say that to everyone and you kind of gloss over the whole risk factor. You have a risk appetite that's off the charts, Kevin. What you find is exciting would literally give me a heart attack. At least preface the discussion with that. So the answer, Josh, was no. I'm, I'm, I'm never nervous because I always, if I just went through the recession and I sold my house, I paid off every one of my debts, I, no bankruptcy, no, for, no foreclosure. Um, I ended up painfully, after the long slog, on dry land. It's, if I can do that, I, you know, I, I've, seen, I've seen the darkest hour and it's fine. Um, whether I get the funding on the dumbbell through crowdsourcing or whether I have to go raise the last million from asking a rich person for, for the check, um, that doesn't worry me at all. Question about creativity. Creativity question. Yeah, the question is can I feed an architectural practice in my projects based on what I do? I don't actually have an architectural practice. I hire Dale for that. Um, and uh, I'm not licensed. Uh, I do have, you know, I, I, I do have four people that, that work for me, one of them full time, the rest part time. Um, and I, I like hiring architects because I like architects' brains. They have this left brain, right brain thing that I think good development needs. Um, most developers don't either have both hemispheres or use both hemispheres. I think they'd be a better world if they did. But I like hiring a certain kind of brain, but then training them to do maybe not architecture. I, I don't give up a lot of the design love um, in-house or even to Dale. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm taking the riskiest seat at the table so I can be the create. I get to, I want to, I get to buy the creative hat um, through risk, not through my own big fat pocketbook because I don't have one of those. Anyone else? Anyone else in the back? In the middle? Do you have plans to take uh, your, your, your business model beyond Portland? Like, do you see that? Ah, good question. Could the business plan go beyond Portland? No. <laughs> but you can move out of Portland. You can move to the. 
so where so <laughs> no because because so so like a group from hawaii from the kamehameha foundation came to portland to look at the zipper uh, to look at the ocean and it was just we're eating at unamas and i didn't google them beforehand and afterwards i realized they're sitting on billions with a b of of capital in in hawaii and they are doing kaka'ako which is a product just on the edge of, of honolulu and they want me to go do the ocean there and like money's not an object I'm like, well, God, I gotta go to Hawaii, and this would be this would be fantastic. I said no, because it's it takes. I know who the new sous chefs are um, that are looking for a space here in Portland. I I know where to go hunt for. I, I love curating the the shit out of my buildings. It's just it's a fun part of the process. I can't be dropped into into uh, Cincinnati or Honolulu and find those people without really embedding myself into that city. You know, Matthew worked for me. We, when we were interviewing, he talked about, well, yeah, maybe I'll move to Detroit. I'm like, good, learn as much as you can for me, uh, and then please move to Detroit. Um, Anna, who was my, the product manager I had before Matthew, lives in Boston right now. She's making an offer on a building in Providence, and we were talking about it over the phone, whether it becomes a, a guerrilla project, and she's my East Coast branch, whether she starts her own company. I don't care, but um, that's kind of the evangelical in me. Um, the ideas are strong, just it's not a Portland-specific idea. I, I gave a lecture at Harvard about, about the rocket, and afterwards, a room, room full of really smart kids, crazy smart kids, and, the, and one of the questions was, yeah, we can't do, that's, only, that's a Portland thing. We can't do that here. And I'm like, you fucking idiot. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, you're smarter than, I didn't call him a fucking idiot, but, but I'm like, well, wherever, you're, wherever you live, you could do something like this. The idea is, if there's this formula that, that developers aren't necessarily smarter than us, um, uh, so if there's not some magic behind that formula, just invent the new formula. So, I, so I, that's why I post everything online. I got an email last night from some guy in Perth, Australia. He's like, just so you know, I'm doing a building similar to, you know, I, is it okay that I copy your idea? I'm like, God, of course, you know. None of my ideas are original. Whenever I think I have an original idea, like, like the zipper with the lenticular art, a buddy from, from architecture school emailed me uh, you know, a handful of months later, hey, that's a really neat building. It reminds me of this one in Berlin. And I see an image, I'm like, fuck. <laughs> it's, it was done three years earlier, and it's better. <laughs> Nothing's original. Yeah, that's a good question. So yeah, Ashley and I sat down and had coffee and we were talking about ideas and I answered her question at coffee the same way I answered whose question here in the second row? Um, your question, first row, about, um, about Hatch, which was, this is awesome, this is great, I, you can't, I'm sorry, I can't help you. But, but I can help you because it's the same exact, it's the same nut we're all trying to crack. So you and Steve are working on, a, on the policy side on passing new laws. Eli Spivak is as well. Some, a lot of people are, playing the long game, which is actually more important than what I'm doing. Um, I, just because I have ADD and I can't sit and still in a room for more than a half an hour meeting, doesn't mean that, that what you're doing isn't super vital and, and important to, to making Portland uh, uh, a more compelling and affordable and mixed income city that we all want to live in. Um, but, but how to get that accomplished is a good question. So on your outreach, so anyone who wants to talk to Ashley afterwards, it's a great, it's a, it's a, it's a great way you know, if you, if you want to play the short game, give me $3,000. Um, even if you don't, just give me $3,000. <laughs> um, but if you want to make deeper, substantial change, I mean, talk to Ashley and people like Eli and Steve and Ashley who are, who are changing policy to mandate that developers put affordable housing in their, in their products instead of hoping that the market will figure it out because the market doesn't kind of figure it out usually. And then you look at Welcome Home Coalition. Welcome Home Coalition. There we go. What's my criteria ranking for identifying a, a 
property or location that I want to work on? That's a good question. That's, I can't tell you, then you'll go just buy all my stuff. <laughs> um, no, I, so we're all creative in the room. So we, we probably, so are there any bankers in the room? Raise your hand. Why do I never get bankers to show up on my, my, my talk? <laughs> um, so I, I'll talk to, so m and Bank, I have a construction loan all lined up for the dumbbell. That's great, I met with the banker. We're gonna, I'm getting the 12 and a half million dollars, signing that next month. John Maher is much more powerful than me and we'll figure it out. And, but I would never trust him to figure out, to identify the, the next location. This room, my guess, has a much clearer crystal ball towards what's that next intersection gonna be or what's that next street gonna be than John Maher. I, I love John Maher. Um, but, but so you, already, you probably already have some thoughts on where you would go. You, if, if you don't, the person sitting next to you does. I like Northeast 42nd, north of Fremont. I like the Brooklyn neighborhood. When I say Southeast 144th or 122nd, 22nd and Flavel, I don't even know if that intersection exists. I don't know if, if the grid continues with Flavel. Through. But um, if I'm playing the long game, I'm, I'm hunting in lots of, I'm hunting in, in, on that fringe and I just need to go and believe in it. I need to be inspired or I need to grow, go grab five buddies of mine and we're gonna go buy stuff on 172nd and Flavel and we're just gonna fucking make it. And we're just, you know, we're gonna, um, and that's, by the way, that's gentrification, just in case you weren't noticing. Um, so, but that's, a, I can't if I can't afford to live here, then I'll go buy something for $120,000 and I'll work my ass off and I'll, I'll figure it out. Um, you know, long, how much did your house cost? 150. 150, and that's, an, that's a neat location. Long used to work for me, so he, she can give this lecture on risk just as well. Um, that does, you couldn't buy your house for 150 today. Um, um, but that wasn't a pioneering intersection as much as what you need, the fellow who asked the question, you need to find. Where is that place that you look at it today, but your mom's like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> um, but you can see it. My guess is most of this room ha has a leg up on that. Do you have any advice for young burgeoning professionals or creatives that are trying to get to where you are, but don't necessarily have the capital or stability to do that right now? Yeah, that sucks. That's a tough <laughs> question. No, it does. I, I, no, it's, do, do I have any, any advice for, how old are you? For a 23-year-old person who wants to you know, be doing what I'm showing you, which is I, w I want Portland and the world to be filled with people like you. So thank you, by the way, for even trying. Um, I sat down with, uh, does anyone here go to Portland State in the <coughs> Master's in Real Estate Development program? You do? Anyone else? So I went to coffee this morning, or this week, with somebody who, uh, two, two kids who are in that program, and I was talking about what I do, and they're like, that's not what they teach us. They're teaching us to work for institutional developers and learn how to do spreadsheets for shitty projects. I'm like, really Portland fucking state? I'm like, well, introduce me to somebody. I want to teach a class there. This is, this is wrong. Um, I hate, and then, and then at the end of coffee, they're like, hey, are you hiring? I'm like, oh, God, sorry, I'm not. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that's, it's really tricky because there should be some mentorship program and I have no appetite or capacity to be anyone's mentor. Um, um, that's a fair assessment, I think. <laughs> but, but I'll like, let you look under the hood and you can check out all my stuff um, and I want you to become conversant in it because there'll be, when you're 30, go work for whoever. I got lucky and I worked for the guy sitting next to you and I learned some neat things from the design standpoint, but I never learned. I then took one of our clients, Francesca Gambetti, who works for Shields Opus Johnson, and I took her to coffee and I said, hey, what is a cap rate? How does a pro forma work? And literally in 20 minutes, she taught me how to be a developer. It's not complicated. It's, it's straight math and it's just plugging data in what's rent. I don't know, what do you think rent would, for this would be? I, I'm guessing this much. Let's look on Craigslist. Okay, I'll plug it out. It's, it's, it's not complicated. It's not, but then you have this vision, this idea, you, and, and then you, sadly, the toughest part for me always is how do you get, how do you find the enlightened capital? Then you ask Uncle Milt or Aunt Jeannie for 100,000. I did the ocean with $220,000 from other people's money. That's not a crazy amount of money. I, when I was 23, I couldn't find that kind of money. But when I was 28, I probably could. Join the Small Developers Alliance. Talk to Mary, the Small Developers Alliance. So the answer is always Mary. There's the crystal ball finding and trying to hunt out like what 
might be the next best corner, but there are also like the juicy corners that are just sitting there sort of obviously, like parking lots on NATO. Mm -hmm. like how do we inspire the city or developers who need to have those uh, accredited investors, uh, th those kinds of sites, how do you get those developed? So how do you get the, the plum sites, the parking lots on NATO to build or to, to do something? I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to talk to someone else who's like not like, yes, this is awesome. Like if any one of you has a million dollars, like, oh my God, this is fun, let's talk. If you're like, I may be interested, I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to like convince you or sell you of anything. I don't want to go to Bill Nato, who probably owns that site. I've never met him before, I'm sure he's a nice guy and try to talk him into one of my whimsical ideas. Um, I want you to come to me and say, I've seen what you do, I like it, let's, I'm on board. I don't wanna, even though I talked about being an Amway salesman and my first idea, I don't wanna sell anything. Either you get it or you don't. And if you get it enthusiastically, game on. If you think it might work, it's like, it's like tenants for my spaces. If you walk into a commercial space and you're like, maybe, I don't know. I'm like, oh, cool, we're good. We don't need to, you know. I've seen this enough to know that you're gonna fail in six months and it's gonna suck. If you're like, oh shit, I ha please, please pick me, then it's gonna be awesome. One last question. One last question. Oh, you're standing, I'm sorry. You didn't stand. <laughs> <laughs> Enthusiasm, see, it always counts. What have you learned about taking your family along on your creative journey? Oh, geez, what have I learned about from taking my family along on my creative journey? Um, so I got super lucky because a lot of Beth's friends were like, as we moved into the ocean, they're like, this is so great, comma, I could never do it. <laughs> and I mean, um, it was tough. I mean, I'm looking over at you, Beth. Uh, it, was, it was not easy, but it was just the reality. And we all, by the way, were around in 2009 and 10. So, it, so what, what sucking looked like for you might be different than what it looked like for me, but it still sucked for everyone in this room. Um, so. The kids just, that's just, that's the life they know. So um, at first they were like, why can't we be like other kids? And then once they get into high school, they're like, oh, actually I'm kind of glad that I'm, that I live in a warehouse and live in an auto body shop. So that was the easy part. And you know, Beth is for better or worse. So uh, <laughs> um, but she carried us, she's a hospice nurse. And for three years she carried the family um, and that was kind of great. I don't, I mean, in retrospect, it wasn't great at the time, but you, you just figured it out. It was fun, in retrospect. Oh, a second to last, the penultimate last question. If we want to give you $3,000, what's the steps that we take? We go here first? Just go here, and then if, thanks, by the way. I don't even know. Oh, where's, where's Pat? So where's Pat? Right back there. So he came up to me before the lecture, introduced, my, introduced himself. Hey, yeah, I gave you $3,000. bucks. i am like, you're, wow, thanks. Um, <laughs> But only what, Homer Williams is the only person that is given money that I've met before, met him once before. But otherwise, it's a bunch of strangers, which I think is, I think is more powerful than if, than if I knew you. So thanks, Pat. Um, you just go to the website, and there's a bunch of steps. Thank you very much. <laughs>